Welcome back, everyone, and I hope you're having a great day. In today's video, people share the most terrifying experience they've ever had. Don't forget to like and subscribe. About two years ago, a friend and I were walking home at 4 a.m. My friend was carrying a laptop bag, and I wore a backpack. We were walking on a narrow and poorly lit path with trees clinging to the sides and blocking all view from the outside when I suddenly got this strange feeling of uneasiness. I noticed that there were footsteps coming up from behind us, and as the path turned left, I shot a quick eye back over my shoulder and noticed two guys some 10 meters behind us and fast approaching, not running, but definitely not casually walking. They wore hooded jackets with the hoods pulled over their heads, hiding their faces in shadow. I looked at my friend, who also seemed to have noticed them, and he whispered, those guys are going to fucking mug us. I panicked for a brief moment, this is the kind of thing you hear about but imagine never happening. In less than a second, I thought about the best course of action. I didn't want to fight them, I've never been in a fight in my life, and what if they were armed? I didn't just want to give up and give them my stuff. I had my cell phone, keys, bank card, etc., and what if they still decided to beat the shite out of us just for kicks? I whispered back to my friend, run on three? And we ran. Not a moment later, those two behind us started shouting, hey you. Fucking stop. Get back here. As they started to run after us. Now, I can run pretty fucking fast, but I've got poor stamina and was starting to worry about how far we had to run. I felt like if I stopped for even a moment, they would catch up and I would be beaten, stabbed, killed, or whatever. Stopping was never an option. I was too preoccupied with running and random panic thoughts to really take in the sounds of what was going on around us. But every now and then I could hear them shout at us from behind. I have no idea how close they got or how long they were following us. Fortunately, my friend's parents lived nearby, so we headed for their home, however, to get there, we had to take a shortcut over a very steep forest path, and by the time we got there, I was exhausted. I took two steps and then fell over from not having any strength left in my legs. Unable to stand up, I crawled on all fours as fast as I could. To make matters worse, this was during the winter, and the path was frozen. Every now and then I slipped and had to cling to a nearby rock or root in order to regain my balance. It was scary as hell, just like one of those nightmares in which you run for all your might but you just can't seem to push forward, like there's some invisible force pushing you back and something terrible right behind you. Once I reached the top of the slope, I finally glanced back for the first time since I first spotted the two guys behind us. Trees were preventing me from seeing further than 20 people, but within that distance I couldn't see them. We made it safely to my friend's parents, told them what had happened, and tried to calm down. Once we got inside, we peeked out of the window and spotted the two guys walking on the road we broke off from to climb the slope. They must have run after us quite far to get there that fast. His father offered me a ride home since he was going to work soon anyway. Thinking back on it still makes my heart race, and sometimes I wonder what would have happened if I had run into those two all by myself or with another friend instead of the guy who was with me that night. My other friends aren't nearly as observant as him, and the whole thing would probably have transpired differently. I was driving my boss's Nissan Frontier pickup with a solid steel headache rack for the sign shop I was working at. I was driving on a service road, speeding up to about 60 miles per hour, about to get on the highway. Something darted across the road in front of me. I thought it was a dog, but it could have been a rabbit. I turned to try and avoid it, but overcorrected and tried to re-correct in the other direction. I knew what was about to happen, but there was nothing I could do to stop it. I'd made a terrible amateur mistake. The truck rolled, and for several years afterwards, I could clearly remember each and every impact on the ground that the truck made as it rolled four times and came to a rest on the passenger side. I was clenching so hard and in such shock that it took me several seconds after the rolling came to a stop to realize that I had my foot on the gas and was redlining the engine with one foot on the clutch and the other on the gas. I let go, turned off the engine, and took the key out. I looked down, towards the passenger window, and there it was, the fucking tire jack that was normally strapped down behind the seat had come loose and propped itself sideways between the passenger headrest and the roof of the truck, not three inches from my head. It scared the shit out of me. Never mind that I just rolled a truck four times and my shoulder was bleeding from the seat belt taking a chunk of skin out of me, but the realization that the jack was that close to being stuck in my head rather than the truck roof scared me senseless, more so than the wreck. By this time, people had pulled over on the highway and were coming to help me out. I was standing on the ground inside the truck, where the passenger window had been just staring at the jack. I tried to move it, but it wouldn't budge. Two guys were trying to pull me out of the truck, but all I could say was, do you see that? The jack almost killed me. They didn't look at it twice. 
I had flashbacks of that wreck for almost five years. I was in a really bad car accident when I was 12. My dad and I were on a trip to visit the Dayton, Ohio, Air and Space Museum, and on the way back, we got into a car accident. My dad was looking at a map while driving and accidentally drove into a five-way intersection where we had a red light. I was sitting on the right rear seat of our car when a minivan slammed into the side of our car, on the same side as I was sitting, at around 40 miles per hour. I just remember my head slamming into the door harder than anything I've ever felt in my life and then feeling an incredibly fast spinning sensation. Our car spun around four and a half times, according to the witnesses, I blacked out and then woke up a little bit later. Our car was sitting on the side of the road and was surrounded by people who were looking into the window and were telling me not to move. I was awake for about 10 seconds before I blacked out again. The thing that made me scared was that for those 10 seconds, I could not breathe. I blacked out again and woke up in an ambulance, where I was completely strapped down to a backboard and hooked up to an oxygen tank, which they later told me was not necessary but they had done as a precaution. After getting the most thorough medical examination I've ever had, I saw a doctor, had x-rays of almost all of my body, and had other medical tests done, I was released from the hospital. I overheard the doctor talking to my dad and telling him that all of the tests and x-rays showed that I had no injuries or broken bones from the crash. Aside from the huge black eye and a bunch of small cuts, I came out of the crash completely unscathed. While talking to my dad, who is also a doctor, the doctor said, he's a lucky little bastard. A crash like that, where the car hit the door where he was sitting, could easily have left him paralyzed. That's one lucky little kid you have there. After I had just started soloing, I was working on getting my private pilot's license, I went off by myself to practice some ground reference maneuvers. I was flying a Cessna 150, a small, two-seat airplane. The weather was perfect, bright blue sky, no clouds, just enough wind to give me good practice in correcting for the effects of crosswinds on these maneuvers. So near the end of my practice, I saw a really dark line of clouds to my south, but they looked so far away and I was almost done, so I decided to finish up. All of a sudden, the line of storms was on top of me, and I decided I needed to get my ass on the ground ASAP. So I call into the airport and tell them I'm on my way back, and they give me clearance to land while I'm still a few miles out, it's a fairly small airport, and they knew I was a student who just started soloing, so they also wanted me to get back on the ground too. On the way back to the airport, the wind was just tossing the plane around, it was really, really scary. I thought I was just going to fall out of the sky, and I started looking around for good fields in case I couldn't make it back to the airport. By the time I got back into the pattern at the airport and turned final, it was raining and there was a really strong direct crosswind. The landing was looking really bad, and I thought I was going to have to go around and get another shot at it, but the weather was just going to get worse and worse, so I decided I really needed to make the landing. I managed to line back up with the runway, and I used all of my strength, which there wasn't much of, I'm a girl with little upper body strength, to land on the wheel into the wind first, but I didn't manage that, and the other will touch down first. It was terrifying. I thought the wind was going to flip the plane, but I managed to get it on the ground. I was shaking, but I managed to taxi to the parking lot and tie down the plane. When I got back to the terminal, the employees were all really impressed that I made that landing, they'd all been watching and were worried about me out there. My dad, a former naval aviator, had been on his way home from work when the weather turned, and he turned back towards the airport when he realized I was flying. He met me at the terminal and drove me home because I was still shaking so much. We were driving back to the university campus at 2 a.m. down a long, dark highway. All of a sudden, I remember a split second of swerving tires, screeching cars, and boom, everything was black and quiet, and I felt like I was sinking. I was thinking to myself, whoa, is this what it feels like to be dead? It took a few seconds for me to figure out what happened, and I started seeing some light in the far left. It turns out the tire burst, the car swerved and went over a pile of sand, flipped over, broke two lamp posts, and landed upside down in a big pile of sand. The reason I felt like I was floating was because I was being held upside down by the seatbelt. The reason I felt I was sinking was because the sand was going in everywhere, nose, mouth, etc. I unbuckled the seatbelt, fell onto the roof, and crawled towards the light. After we both got out of the car, we looked back and the window was crushed, probably five or six inches high, and we thought, how the hell did we crawl out of that? But I guess when you think you're about to die, you lose sense of everything else. We were fine otherwise, besides scrapes from the glass and minor bruises, but the feeling of thinking you're dead is probably the most terrifying thing ever. I've had a couple of cold death feelings. One was when I was driving back from visiting my granddad on the highway. It's not a straight one, it's all twisty. I was getting mom to adjust the mirror for me, and I didn't realize that I'd pulled out into the other lane, 
and just as I looked up, I was 10 meters from hitting an oncoming car. That scared the snot out of me. The second one was that I live across the road from an open cut mine, and they do underground blasting. I was standing at my bedroom window, watching my horses graze in the front paddock. Well, they let off an explosion. It first rumbled my house, and then the noise came. How I can describe it is like a bomb blast from an airplane, the noise was that bad. I hate loud noises, and this was nearly like thunder. I had to learn how to stand up again. My horses went bolting because it scared the shite out of them. I ran outside to see if they were okay. But yeah, too much TNT on that blast. Oh, I also do this every day, it's like a mini earthquake. I remember one time when I was about 10, we have really bad thunderstorms in Queensland, and I can remember a flash of lightning and next thing the biggest clap of thunder. It wasn't a rumble, it was like someone clapping next to your ears. I swear to this day it hit next door shed. Makes me scared of storms to this day. The only time I've been genuinely 100% terrified was when I went into the loft to get my two-year-old nephew some toys while we were babysitting him. Typically, mom dumps him on me and does her thing while I was job hunting at the time but took an afternoon off to entertain. So I'm up in the loft when I hear a kid's voice saying, NNNGH stuck stuck. I looked down the ladder, and he was three rungs up trying to climb up. I was fucking terrified. Had he fallen, there was a chance of not only a nasty fall from a metal ladder, but our staircase was perfectly in line for a fall down that too. From the top of the ladder, I couldn't do much, so I screamed for my mom to come and get him, which of course terrified my nephew and got him bawling, so I'm all crazy and say, it's okay, look, I've got you a dinosaur, to calm him down while mom comes up to get him off there. Nothing has compared to that, and I've had some ridiculous car near misses, including a last second swerve on a highway in Houston to avoid a huge fucking freezer that would have killed us, I was the passenger. The most terrifying feeling was being deep underwater and realizing that I was drowning. I was on a scuba diving open water test and was in a lake that is fed by glacier runoff. When I was to do my mask clearing, the cold water hit me, and all of a sudden I could not breathe. I struggled to breathe but couldn't. My brain must have told my body that the reason I couldn't breathe was because of the regulator in my mouth, so logically, I ripped it out and took a full breath. This is when I realized I was fucked. I had a lung full of water and was deep under freezing cold water. At that moment, I remember coming to the realization that I would die. However, my survival instinct kicked in, and I began to puke and cough up as much water as I could expel from my lungs. I also started to try and swim towards the surface, but my spare regulator was caught on the guideline. One of the other students was trying to free me, but at the same time my instructor was holding me under so I wouldn't surface too quickly and get the bends. By now I was suffocating or drowning pretty painfully, and all I could do was shake my head from side to side, though I don't know why. I then felt something at my lips, my instructor was attempting to give me her regulator, but I couldn't let it in because my jaw was clenched so tightly. She got it in by basically punching me right in the mouth with it. With it in, I still could not breathe, but somehow I forced the smallest breath, and it was enough. She guided me to the surface and helped me while I puked and coughed and regained my awareness. It was pretty terrifying, but it also showed me my refusal to accept death and fight to survive. The very first night I moved into my own house, sophomore year of college, out of the dorms, none of my roommates had moved in with me, and all I had at the time was a mattress. It was an empty house. My first time. That night, I was lying in bed awake, doing the typical every sound as a burglar type of paranoia. But then a shadow passed over my window, my room was on the first floor. I freaked out and peeked out and saw a big black man roaming around the side of my house, looking into the windows. I crept out of bed and went to the front door. As I crouched in front of it, I heard steps coming up my porch and then fiddling with the door. Somehow, I had forgotten to lock it, and the door started to creak open. When it was about three inches open, I put all my weight into one shove and hammered the door closed, slamming the lock as fast as I could. I heard a deep voice say, ow, fuck, and then step fast down the porch and away. I called the cops, but nothing could really be done at that point. I never forgot to lock the doors or windows again. For me, Getting stuck in a rip current takes the cake. I was boogie boarding in the surf, as I had done countless times before. I got tired and decided to swim back in. One problem. I couldn't. I was getting further and further away. It's as scary as shite to see things getting smaller on the shore and think there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. I had my first panic attack that day. I was so exhausted, and there was no escape. There was definitely a point at which I thought I was going to die. It's a damn scary feeling. So I laid on my boogie board until I calmed down. Then I thought it through. 
I knew rip currents were just breaks in the sandbar. So it has to end at some point, right? So I swam parallel to the shore and got out of it. At that point, I was at least two football fields away. I swam in until I found the sandbar, then crawled ashore and collapsed. I googled rip tides, thinking that I was a genius for outsmarting them. It turns out I did exactly what you told me to do. This past summer, my boyfriend at the time and I were going to my sister's new house to help her take care of her four boys and spend the night. It was around dinner time, and she needed some stuff from the grocery store. Now neither of us really knew the area, but she gave us simple enough directions. We're driving down a highway with an 80 km per hour speed limit, and we're going around 90. All of a sudden, my boyfriend says, what the hell is this bitch doing? Some girl ran a stop sign, going at least 80 km per hour. She had rumble strips, a yield stop sign, and a huge stop sign. She blew all three. I t-boned my boyfriend's side. She didn't step on the brakes at all throughout the whole accident. If my boyfriend hadn't swerved, he would have died. Guaranteed. I talked to the girl, and she told me she stopped. Sure, she did. We didn't have a stop sign, and she got charged with careless driving. The boyfriend's car was totaled. Her car had the front fender off. Both were write-offs. Her car was only worth $300, while his was worth $100,000 or more. About a month after the accident, we were driving back from another city, and I said, I feel like there's going to be an accident. About 15 minutes later, some assface almost did the same thing the other girl did and started pulling out from a stop sign. His boyfriend swerved, and he probably would have hit us too. When I was in high school, a group of friends went swimming at night in the school pool, a full-size pool for water polo and swim competitions. It was probably winter, as the plastic covers were on. As the covers are in strips about 20 feet wide you can swim with your head touching the underside of the covers and eventually pop up in the gap. The guys I was with had done this before and were swimming back and forth between the plus and minus 5 gaps across the length of the pool. I had a lapse in concentration and swam for the gap at the bottom of the pool without touching the underside of the covers. Bear in mind that it is pitch black under swimming pool covers at night. I quickly realized I had made a huge mistake, as when I came up, I wouldn't know if I was before or after the gap. The sense of disorientation and panic hit me like a freight train. I swam to the top and felt the covers above my head. I then didn't know whether to swim backward or forward or whether I had even changed course and was aiming for the side. I was starting to run out of air, so I just started going for it. It felt like I was swimming forever under there, but I eventually popped out in a gap and took a massive gulp of air. I pulled myself onto the covers and just lay there for ages, panting. No one else had even noticed, as there were 15 people and everyone was running around in their own excited state. I could have been found in that pool the next day. I never told any of my friends about it. I've been in a near fatal car accident, though my injuries were relatively minor, my mom almost died, had a gun pointed at my face, and been in countless life or death situations, but a dream I had is the one thing that scared me beyond anything else. In my dream, I was with my then husband in the car on the freeway. The road came to an abrupt, unexpected end at a cliff. The other cars were somehow able to turn in time and avoid danger, but I couldn't. I had about two seconds of white-hot sheer terror, then I simply accepted that I was about to die, there was nothing I could do to stop it, and it would all be okay in just a moment. I chose in that instant to spend the last moments of my life at peace. And then I woke up. It sounds dumb, but the thought of accepting my own inevitable death screwed with my head something fierce. I ended up actually having to talk to a therapist about it because I couldn't stop thinking about that feeling. It was kind of hard even to type it out. This happened a few years ago. Last day of my open water diver license tests. I'm about to go on to the exam proper. 18 meters underwater. The instructor beckons me over and signals that before we go on to the important stuff, we're going to cover some of the basics again, just because we can. One of the basic skills you learn as a diver is how to recover your mouthpiece in case it gets knocked out of your mouth. You do this by reaching with your arm where your air bottle's valve is, then sweeping the arm all the way up the tube to where the regulator is and catching it. So the instructor says, watch first, then repeat. He takes his regulator out, casually tosses it aside, and looks at his watch. About 15 to 20 seconds pass, he then effortlessly finds the thing and puts it back in his mouth, clears it, and starts breathing normally. Points to me and goes, now you. Being the cocky show-off that I am, at 17, I take a deep breath, remove the regulator from my mouth, and toss it aside like a boss while looking the instructor straight in the eye. I then started counting while slowly blowing bubbles. 15 to 20 seconds later, I reach for the valve. Of course, 
I didn't notice the regulator tube getting trapped under the valve when I threw it away with such force. The thing is floating in the water behind me, directly away from me. 30 seconds later, I still haven't found it. This is where I start panicking. I've been slowly blowing out what little air I had in my lungs over the past 30 seconds. I am 18 meters underwater, and as soon as I run out of air, I'm going to inhale as hard as I can by reflex. Someone told me that having water in your lungs is not good for you. I start reaching for the thing more and more nervously, eventually to the point of thrashing about. As my face reaches its third shade of purple, I finally get a grip on the tube, manage to uncoil it from the valve, and put the regulator back on, taking the deepest breath I've ever taken. Throughout all of this, of course, I managed to completely ignore the backup regulator that was affixed to my chest, or the one on my instructor's chest, since I was so intent on recovering my original one. In retrospect, I might not have been 100% doomed, the instructor would very probably have stepped in and saved the day, although I could swear he didn't look like he noticed I was having serious trouble. I still like to think I had a very close brush with death that day. So it's summer going into 11th grade, and me and a good friend decide to hit up this huge grad party out of town. He picks me up in his Ford Ranger, and we head off into the night. We get there, and the women are inebriated, the douchebags are plentiful, and the alcohol is bountiful. I'm getting hammered at this point, and I am under the impression that my friend isn't drinking because he's driving. So when the time comes for us to leave, I ask Bor, we'll call him that for now, if he's been drinking. He replies, no. Here's where it gets interesting. Scenario, when we normally go home. We usually take a back route that is very hilly. We call it Humpty Dumpty Road. Usually, we go super fast and try to get air or do some dumb things that high school kids like to do. Now, Boar is a daredevil. Being the daredevil that he is, he has always had this fantasy of doing the stunt, which is when he climbs out of the driver's side window, into the bed, and climbs back into the passenger side window while the car is in motion. He used to talk about it all the time, but we always thought he was joking. So it's me and him, in a little Ford Ranger, on a very hilly road. I'm drunk, but not too drunk. He looks at me after about 30 seconds of being on this road and says, I'm going to do it. Being drunk and tired, I say, do what? He says, I'm doing it, hold the wheel. We're going about 30 miles per hour, he starts lowering the window, and by the time I get control of the wheel, and he is halfway out of the car. I am now screaming at him like a mother screaming at her child to get off the top of a cabinet. Now, his feet are on the bottom of the window, and as soon as he takes a step towards the bed of the trunk, whoosh, he slips, and all I see is a blur of a human falling off of the car. I start laughing because, knowing Boar, he would just get up and be all hearty har, let's do it again. I pull the truck over, get out, and see a lifeless body lying in the middle of the road. It just got real. I ran over and tried to get him conscious, in hindsight, I could have broken his neck. He doesn't respond. I take out my phone to call an ambulance, and I have no service, I didn't know you could make emergency calls without service. So, I pick him up, put him in the car, and start driving towards the hospital. Midway through the ride, my mom calls me, which would never normally happen. I guess her mom's senses were tingling. She asks if everything is alright. I tell her the situation because I can never lie to mama. She asks if I have been drinking. I tell her I have been. She tells me, you're going to get to the hospital, you'll get questioned by police, and you'll go to jail for a DWI. I was thinking, gee, thanks mom, but I had a more important issue at hand. A minute later, Boar becomes semi-conscious. I thank the heavens. He starts mumbling that he wants to go home. I was about to take him home, but I had a really bad feeling that it would not end well. See, what happened when he fell off the car was that he landed on his feet but then went straight to his head at 30 miles per hour. We look at Boar as a cat, substituting lives with concussions. This was like his eighth, so I know it's serious. I get to the hospital, drag him in, and ask for emergency help. The nurse comes out, and lo and behold, it's my best friend's mom, who is also very familiar with Boar. I tell her the story while he gets treated, and thank God she was my nurse, because no one would believe this story except for people who know Boar. Boar's parents come to the hospital, I explain what has happened, and they have no trouble believing it. While I was doing this, two police officers were in the hallway keeping an eye on me, not exactly staring me in the face, but making it clear they were watching me. Once I finish recounting what had happened, another nurse goes to the police officers and whispers something in their ear, the nurses knew I had been drinking. They look at me and leave. Meanwhile, Boar is getting airlifted to a larger hospital that can take better care of him. The next day, I found out he had severe scraping and two blood clots in his brain. If I had brought him home and he had gone to bed, he would have died. 
he gets out of the hospital a month later. I tell this story endlessly, and now I own his soul. When I was 17, I decided that getting a bag of mushrooms over Christmas break would be a good idea. I got about eight and hid them away for about three days. Finally, Christmas day rolls around. I decided that would be the day I took them. My plan was to sprinkle mushroom powder on my dinner and then retreat to my basement. The unfortunate thing was that my entire family, including many relatives, was there. I finish the mushrooms off at around 9 p.m. and proceed to emphasize that I'm tired and want to sleep, which actually meant I'm about to start tripping balls and don't want shit to do with you all. So I go to the basement and wait for the trip to begin. I was playing some Xbox when I began to notice the letters were breathing. This is where SHT hits the fan. I then went into full panic mode, shutting the Xbox off and going into the bathroom. I couldn't stop dreading my parents or another relative finding out what I was doing. The trip continues. I'm trying my hardest to go with the flow, but being alone and on a high dose of mushrooms makes it very hard. I turn every light in my basement on, even the rooms with the doors closed. I lay on my couch for hours, wondering what the fuck is going on. At one point, my sister came downstairs and asked me to sign a card. I was freaking out because she kept asking me why all the lights were on. I also had music and the TV going at the same time. She eventually leaves, apparently clueless about my state of mind. The trip continues for hours. Time moves by at a snail's pace. All I can hope for at this moment is the time when the trip will end. I continue with my laying until I feel it starting to wind down. I come back to my senses and instantly make a vow to never repeat the experience. I even threw up afterwards. 